Joining me today on the show is without a doubt one of Australia's greatest ever athletes. She's an icon of Australian swimming, and so she should be. She's an eight-time Olympic medalist, spanning three Olympic Games. And in 2000 at the Australian Trials, she beat one of the longest-standing world records at the time, held by Mary T. Ma in the 200 fly. And yes, Susie, I could keep going, but all I need to say is today I'm joined by Madam Butterfly, and I think that says it all. It is my honour to welcome to Off the Block Swimming Podcast to Susie O'Neill. Susie, how are you going? Good, thank you. How are you? Mate, I'm very good. I'm very good. Um, mate, that nickname, Madam Butterfly, which was brilliantly, um, and I think appropriately named um, by Ray Warren, if I'm not mistaken, were you accepting of that at the time? Because I know you're pretty shy. So it's sort of throwing, giving you a nickname, pump your tyres up. Were you happy with it? Oh, I loved it. Um, the, the history of it was that uh, Mary T. Ma, the girl who held the world record before I broke it, um, that was her nickname. Yep. So I uh, kind of stole it. I was either Ray Warren or um, Wayne Smith from the Australian. Sort of around that time, some journalists started calling me that. And I love it. I love it now that... You know, 20 years after I finished, people still call me Madam Butterfly and mm. I love it. <laughs> I almost didn't give you the full intro. I almost went the opposite way today and just started with today I'm joined by Madam Butterfly and left it because I think once I say that, everyone knows exactly who I'm talking to. Mate, I know you went for a swim today and you do swim regularly at Yoronga Park, which is a great facility uh, up there in Brisbane. How much fly does Madam Butterfly still do these days now that she doesn't really have to anymore? Yeah, I rarely do butterfly now. I, if I do, I only do 25 metres in a row. Um, yeah. Just because my shoulders get get sore. I never had any shoulder problems when I swam, but I think now that I've lost a lot of the bulk, mm. you know, that holds my very flexible shoulders together, like most yeah. swimmers, I was hyper-flexible, hyper-mobile. So now when I get in that reach position, it just feels like my shoulders are going to pop out. So I haven't done... I mean, the, two, the last 200 fly I did was in Sydney in the Olympics, and I haven't done more than probably 75 metres in a row since then. <laughs> well, mate, I think still you'd put a lot of people to shame, even if you just did 25. I certainly want to be doing a 25 push fly next year at Yoronga Park, that's for sure. Um, talking of people that do swim at Yoronga Park, I know Jodie Henry, I was talking to her the other day, and I know she gets up there and swims a bit. Have you guys ever thought of putting together like a super Olympic champion squad? <laughs> yeah, it would be good. Yeah, I saw um, Jody there a while back. We used to swim around the same time. And I'll tell you who else is there. You probably know Robbie Van Der Zandt. Yep. He's the coach there. So he's another Olympian that's there. And Mark Stockwell, who was an Olympian back in 84, he pops into the pool a little bit. And Andrew Mewing, um, another swimmer who just missed the Olympics, um, is there. So yeah, there's a lot of oldies who are uh, good swimmers in their day that meet up there. So it's, it's a great atmosphere, that pool. I love it. Jodie was saying your husband goes pretty well too when he gets in the pool. <laughs> was she? That's funny. Yeah, um, she said he goes pretty quick. Yeah, he's probably, he's got a shoulder injury at the moment, but um, he actually probably swims, when his shoulder wasn't sore, he was better than me. So he's taken over that as well. But um, yeah, he's not bad. He, he got a couple of medals at state age and he grew up in Mount Isa and was coached by Bill Sweetenham. Have oh, you heard of him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, very, very good coach. Yeah, Legendary the, Australian coach. Yeah, he started out in Mount Isa back in the 80s. So um, my husband was coached by him back in the day. Yes. <laughs> Mate, keeping with the, with the swimming theme at the moment, I also saw the other day in reply to the uh, great American Katie Ledecky swimming with the cup of chocolate milk on her head that you did in the most Aussie way ever, swim with a cup of beer on your head. Um, that was for obviously your radio um, gig up there with Nova. You, you lasted all the way from what I saw till right at the end and it dropped off just before you touched the wall and you managed to get a little bit in there. Yeah, that was a, just a radio stunt. We were um, watching the Today Show and we saw Katie Ledecky on the news at 6.30 doing that. And so we go, quickly, let's go to the pool and try and do it. So, yeah, it was good. I just, I just turned my head a bit, didn't I, when I went to grab it? <laughs> and I was like, oh, damn it. <laughs> but um, it was a first take because we didn't have much time. So it was a bit of fun. And uh, yeah, got a bit of traction for the radio show, which is what we want. So it was good fun. Yeah, apologies to the commercial pool for the beer that fell in there. I'm assuming I, it looked like commercial. Was it commercial? Yeah, it was. It was at the Valley Pool. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It was, um, the beer, though, was actually 0.0%. It was at <laughs> Heineken. <stuff. laughs> yeah, yeah. Still looking <laughs> so, after no. yourself, I see. 
Yeah, yeah. But it was fun. <laughs> Mate, in regards to the pandemic at the moment, have you been affected at all? I mean, you know, I know obviously the Premier up there, Anastasia Palaszczuk, has done a good job in sort of blocking borders and looking after you guys. But, you know, have you been affected with work or family in any way? Uh, not really. We kept working through it. Um, apparently the radio was an essential service. <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously, sh- uh, pools c- shut down, which was a bummer. But um, my mum's actually just gone into hospital so for a knee replacement and they've um, banned all visitors at hospital. So that's the only kind of h- hard thing that we're going through at the moment with her. But um, hopefully she'll be out within a week and then we can see her again. But, yeah, it's been a crazy year, hasn't it? Especially, mm. you know, especially for Olympic athletes, the Olympics should have already been on in Japan. So terrible time. <laughs> yeah. Even just little things, as you said, your mum going in with the, for, for her knee, but even that then sort of gets you worried because obviously there's sick people in there and with all this other stuff going around. So that couldn't be easy then. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's been, um, they've been petrified about getting um, COVID. Mm. Uh, they live in one of the hot spots, um, Sunnybank up here yeah. where those Logan ladies were partaking. So they were, <laughs> They've been um, they've been paranoid about catching it, so they've been really, really careful, and they've just been stuck at home. So it, mm. yeah, hopefully next year opens up a bit and everyone can start socialising a bit more. Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned there the Olympics being pushed back. How do you think you would have gone if you were swimming at the moment, uh, and it all got pushed back? How do you think you would have handled it? I reckon it's tough. It's really tough. I mean, I suppose the only thing you could do is put it into perspective with everything that's happening. But um, uh, yeah, just the uncertainty of it. Um, I. Th- I think it'd be really hard at the moment to keep training really, really hard because I know when I swam, you've really got to give every session, you know, a hundred percent. You can't really slacken off at all. And what's driving, what drove me was my competition coming up. So when they, if moving the goalposts like that would be very difficult for motivation, I'd imagine to try and just keep giving it to yourself, especially at the end of your career. You know, if you're early on your career, you can go, well, this training's not being wasted. You know, if worst comes to worst in four years, four years time all that training will pop out hopefully yeah. in an event but if you're at the end of your career like say uh, an Emily Seabom and even a Kate Campbell maybe it would be hard to I think keep going yeah I must admit I spoke to Hannah Miley um, a Scottish and English swimmer uh, yeah, great yeah. swimmer the other day and um, she's I think turning 31 this year and I had to tip my hat to her because she's like no I'm gonna go again I'm gonna trial for the Olympics I was like mate oh. uh, yeah. respect because at, at that age I mean I'm 34 I'm nowhere near in sort of the shape that the obviously athletes are in but I struggle to get out of bed let alone be getting up and, and putting all the hard yards to make an Olympics especially in Scotland is she in Scotland yeah she's always yeah. the videos I see on Instagram are always cold and raining it's certainly not inspiring that's for sure her dad coaches it too doesn't he yeah 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 he does he does yeah I remember her back from She's been swimming for years. Yeah, no, she's yeah, she's going for it. She's going for another one. God bless her. It's like after I finished, I finished swimming. She popped on the scene. But yeah, wow, exactly. Awesome. Mate, let's get stuck into your swimming career now, um, and and what a career it was. How did it all start for you? So, what drew you towards the pool? Um, we we had all the holidays at the beach um, as a family. We're I was quite sporty at a lot of different sports. I, was, I played tennis and, and ran and, and different things. Um, I had a teacher, Mrs. Brett, who encouraged me to get into swimming. Um, I was good at, at carnivals. And she was like, oh, you can go to zones or you can, and then you can go to regionals. And, you know, that competition type thing really got me into it. And so we just went down to our local pool, which was just three kilometres away. And I started training there with um, Acacia Club with a, a coach called Mr. Wakefield. Mm-hmm. And I just happened to luck on to the best coach ever, especially for that age. And I've got, I've got such good memories of that time. I'm still friends with um, some of the people I swam with then. Them. We were in the Super 7s group. So we used to train from 7 to 8 o'clock in the morning. And I remember I would have been about 10 and we'd all drive to the pool. You know how you used to always have your cap and your goggles? You ready, know, to go. on, yeah. ready to go. Ready to go. Hogs and holes, I remember. We'd wear with our cap and goggles. <laughs> and... Um, I remember we put our bags like up on this, um, there was a rise with gla- grass and then there were, we put our bags up here and the pool was down here. Mm-hmm. And I remember Mr. Wave, we used to always say, come on, Super 7s. And we'd all like <laughs> run down, really excited. And, um, oh, you know, I've just got such good memories from that time. He was such an amazing coach and made it really, really fun. And, and um, it was never 
it was never onerous, you know, it was never like hard work. It was, mm. he was very, a very clever coach. Did you get into any other sports when you were younger being competitive? I'm assuming you would have liked to do a few other things as well. Yeah. I used to play tennis fixtures pretty seriously. I used to play twice a week, Thursday and Saturday mornings and have um, private coaching, you know, for yeah. that. And I, yeah. I played state, state titles tennis as well. Um, and at school I did well in the cross country and um, athletics as well. And if I can brag, I, I st- <laughs> I'll brag. I still hold the, um, I still hold the 14 years, 400 meter running race at my old high school, which must be over 30 years now, yeah. old now. That I but um, I used That's to love cool. running. As well. Was that ever an option for you? I mean, obviously once you fell in love with swimming, that sort of took off and obviously you got success at such a young age, it was hard for you not to sort of you know, go that way. But when you were, you know, say 12, 13, was running or tennis ever an option that you were looking at? No, not really. Um, running, I didn't, I didn't love that much because it was hot. It was always hot in Queensland. Mm-hmm. And remember, Little Athletics used to be in the hot afternoon sun. Yeah. Um, Friday Arvos? Yeah, I think it was Sunday for some mm-hmm. reason. Anyway, um, but and tennis, I didn't like all the thought process that went into it. You know how like the games used to go for so long that uh, I didn't like that part mm-hmm. of it. But swimming, I liked it was pretty short. And I liked that I was you it could control a lot, of, a lot of things you know what i mean like in your lane rope you know you don't have to worry about the ball coming back yeah. or people around you you sort of separated so i, I just love swimming the best in my research i found out a few things about you and one was that as a youngster one of the things your dad used to say or advice his mantra was um Actually, no, I'm not going to tell you what it was. I was going to get you to say what it was. I just realized what I put there. Uh, what did he tell you and how much did you take that to heart? Was that the, um, yeah, don't think you're better than anyone else just because you're good at swimming. Yeah. It's not so much that he said it. My, both my parents had that attitude, but it's certainly something that um, was instilled in, in all of us as a family. So I've got a brother and a sister as well. And um, they were very mindful, my parents, of, of not building one sibling up compared to the others. Yeah. Um, they were really, and now I know that I've got, I've got two kids now myself. I've got a 16 year old and a 14 year old and I can see how, I can see why they did that now. Um, at the time I used to think that, that they weren't like other parents. They didn't really praise me a lot or actually either any of us siblings. Yeah. <laughs> My brother and sister are quite successful as well. They're, um, they're both doctors now, but um. I think they were just trying to keep us grounded and, you know, just not get too carried away with it all, which um, I'm very appreciative of, appreciative of now. Another thing I noticed in that, which I, um, I really liked was that, you know, def- definitely they were supportive of you, but they weren't too over the top, as you just said. And by that, I mean, with your swimming, they definitely trusted your coach and his direction. They allowed you to do your thing. How important is that, do you think, in terms of advice for parents out there that are listening to the podcast to allow their kids to enjoy swimming and let them sort of do it how they want to do it and not make it something they kind of have to do and not like in the end? Oh, yeah, I think it's so important. Um, my parents from a very young age if I told me that if I wanted to go swimming, then I had to wake myself up and then wake them up yeah. to take swimming, which I think is excellent. Um, they weren't, yeah, they weren't really involved. They didn't know any of my best times. They didn't really ask about training or swimming. They facilitated everything, which yeah. must have been very, um, you know, you got to put a lot of work into that as a parent, <laughs> driving your kids around and yeah. getting in places and that sort of thing. But they certainly never put any pressure on me. They didn't own a stopwatch, which um, was excellent. Mm. Um, I don't know. That was just, it was just perfect. And, and all the, all the swimmers that I know that really made it right at the end, like um, Thorpey and oh, I can't think of any names. I don't want to um, name them. I know yeah. Thorpey's one of them I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> their, their parents were not really in, into it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It was, they were the, the swimmers are really self-motivated and it's such a hard sport that you really got to want to do it yourself. If someone's telling you to do it, then, um, then I don't think it's going to be a lot harder to make it. And I was always with coaches that my parents liked and trusted. So, um, yeah, they just left it up to my coach. And they never spoke to the coach either, which I think is another good tip for parents. 
Definitely. I, I agree with you a hundred percent, especially with, you know, getting yourself up. My dad was fairly similar in that way when I started in the gold squad, which, you know, was, was a big yeah. move for me because I wasn't anywhere near the swimmer that you guys were. I don't even think I made nationals. Um, but, you know, he would say, you know, if, if you don't want to wake up, that's all right. That's up to you, though. I'm not coming in to get you up. And the thing with Alan, I told you I trained with Alan Thompson, was if you weren't coming into training, you had to call him. You couldn't text him. You couldn't just not show up. You had to call and say, I'm not coming because of, you know, whatever oh, wow. reason. And there was never really a good enough reason to call him. So I'd yeah. always have to go, oh, just I better get up. I better get up. Yeah. How would you go with the other- mornings? Um. I didn't mind the mornings, but I was just going to say that's the other thing my parents said, though. When I did start a season, yeah. I had to do all the sessions as well because it was quite often – I didn't go so bad with the mornings. For me, it was like the afternoons and especially, say, Friday afternoon. Yeah. And I remember getting picked up from school going, oh, you know, occasionally. <laughs> I don't – probably like every second Friday, I don't want to go swimming. And mum would say, well, that's fine. Don't sign up for it next season, you yeah. know. Signed up for this – these training sessions, so I'm going to take you there, and you'll enjoy it once you get there. Mm. You'll enjoy it once you get there. <laughs> that was her big. Um, I remember that was her big, big thing as well. Mate, I definitely can appreciate that. I do the same thing for work now. I mean, apologies <laughs> to all the parents of the kids I coach that are listening, but Friday afternoons is yeah. not the most enthusiastic thing to be driving to. That's for sure. Yeah, it's the hardest session, isn't it? But my uh, my coach back then, Mr. Wakefield, used to pick me up for a lot of the morning trainings as well. So I can remember um, vividly, like we started at um, 5 a.m. at Chandler in winter. Um, so he would pick me. Oh, I'm in Brisbane. Okay. You probably don't. Doesn't mean no, me. I know. I lived up in Brisbane <laughs> for five years, so I'm good. I know where you are. Okay. So uh, he, would pick, he would pick up like a group of us, a carload of us, um, and take us out to the pool. So he would probably pick me up around 4.20. Mm. And I remember getting up and I'd go downstairs and I'd I'd get a muesli munch, like there's muesli munch. And I'd be yeah. sitting in my window with my lights out, eating my muesli munch, just waiting for his car to come down the street and he'd run down. So um, I have kind of good memories of that. I don't really have any memories of not wanting to get up, certainly early on in my career. Later yeah. on, it was a bit harder. A bit harder. I, yeah. Later what on. did he used to listen to when you were driving? Because I'm assuming there's a bit of an age gap there and a lot of older people have AM radio and things like that in the morning. What did you listen to when you were driving? Do you remember? Um, with the whole squad, he was really big of, um, with telling stories okay. on the way home from training. But I, I remember he used to love Credence Clearwater Revival. Mm-hmm. That's the main thing I remember. So he listened to that kind of era of music. I can't remember him having the radio on. He must have had tapes tapes on and he's taped it. <laughs> but, um, and um, in the afternoon training when he'd pick us up sometimes or we'll drop us home, I remember he'd always be eating apples. That's the other thing I He's always eating an apple. And he always smelled a bit of cigarette smoke because his wife... <laughs> That's always smoke, good. Smoke like a chimney. So, and he'd always be, he'd be eating apples and sucking on quickies. You know, those quickies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whipping tablets, sort of. <laughs> That's I remember from my car trips. But you made your debut on the Australian team at a very young age. Uh, I think at 15, you competed at the Pan Packs and the following year you went on to Com Games in Auckland, World Champs in Perth in 1991. For such a young girl, what was it like being on the Australian team at that age? Did you enjoy it for what it was and the experience and the learning opportunities and sort of a, a little bit more carefree or was it overwhelming with the sort of pressure racing for the green and gold? Because I can see how it could go both ways at a young age. Yeah. Um, the swimming side wasn't so bad. Socially, I found it quite um, difficult. I was very young and, and as you said, very shy. I'm actually wearing um, a tracksuit top from the 1990 Commonwealth Games at the oh. moment. Which I think Auckland. Is that's your, isn't that one of your favourite games? Oh, yeah, definitely. So that's it there. I think it's come back in fashion. But, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was overwhelming to start with. Uh, I, re- I got put in a room in my first team with a girl by the name of Donna Proctor, okay. a medley swimmer from Newcastle. And I'm actually friends with her still. Like she yeah. was an excellent, excellent roomie. Um, so everyone was really welcoming. I didn't say much. In fact, a lot of people say I didn't say a single word in my first, <laughs> in my first team away. And then the Commonwealth Games 1990 was, um, it was amazing as well. And, but swimming wise, yeah, it was scary and stuff, but nothing like it was. I had no pressure on me. Mm. No no, I mean, my coach at the 99 Commonwealth Games was Ken Wood, um, and I remember he said to me, "You can win at, you can win a gold medal." And I've I couldn't believe it because I remembered the Brisbane Commonwealth Games in 1982, 
which is probably another reason why I got, got into swimming, watching that on TV. And I, I couldn't believe I was at the Commonwealth Games, let alone, you know, I could win a gold medal at the Commonwealth Games. And um, it was a really fun trip. I ended up coming second in the 100 fly to Lisa Curry. Mm-hmm. It was a big deal back then. She just made a comeback. She'd had a baby. You know, she was super mum. Yeah. And then we won the four by 100 freestyle relay as well. But um, had a really good, yeah, it was a really good trip. There was some, it was a first team. It was the beginning of the new wave of swimmers that came in around that time. You know, Kieran Perkins, Chris Feidler, um, Andrew Balden. Was Sam oh, Riley coming in around then? She was the year after. Yeah. Yeah, she came the year after. There was a, and uh, Phil Rogers was in that team. Oh, I can't remember, but you know, it was like a new group of people. And it was the first team that Don Talbot, I think oh, he might have been 89. Anyway, ran the first time that Don Talbot became our head coach. So it was exciting times. Really good um, team, team spirit on that team. I remember at the 99 Commonwealth Games, especially. Do you think your shyness ever got um, mistaken or taken the wrong way as, you know, being not up yourself, but kind of just keeping to yourself and doing your own thing, even though it wouldn't have been that way. But for people who didn't know you on the team, do you think it ever got taken that way? Um, I think my mum used to really worry about that. <laughs> she was, she was really, I was just checking to see if my diary was next to me because yeah. um, she was, she gave me something on my first team. She was really concerned that people would think I was a snob. Mm. I've got the, I've got the letter that she wrote me, wrote to me when I made my first team, and it's the funniest thing. She goes, "And remember to remember to smile because everyone thinks will think you're a snob." <laughs> and then, she, and then she gave me, she gave me this little um, poet poem about smiles. Um, a smile costs nothing, but. Um, mean so much and blah 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 and I've kept it it's in my diary I, I have it with me every single day and I think it's it's such good advice isn't it I mean I don't think people probably thought I was shy because I look I mean probably thought I was um, uh, up, up myself because I look probably completely petrified <laughs> um, but I think that was really good advice that um, try and you know just try and smile at people and stuff so uh, yeah, it was funny times. Yeah, so I used to worry about who I would sit next to on the bus, who I would sit next to at meals, who I was, you know, who was going to be my friend if we had free time, who can I hang out with. And um, I was never in my early days really concerned about my swimming results. I was mainly concerned about the social interaction and how I would, how I would fit in with everyone around me. <laughs> Do you think that helped with the longevity of your swimming career? The fact that you weren't at a young age, overanalyzing everything. It's, it tends to happen a lot these days. And I do feel for the 17, 18, 19 year old kids coming through because there's a lot of pressure that gets heaped on them either by themselves or the Australian media and people like that. Whereas to your point there, you were kind of, it's not like you were phoning it in. You're still working hard and going to, to, to you know, do your best. But at the same time, you're enjoying yourself. Yeah. Well, in my mind, it was always just, it was always just a hobby. Um, because previously most people gave up swimming when they finished school or, you know, soon after uh, the generation before me. So it was kind of like, it was what I was doing, but it was never going to be my career. You know, I was never going to be, um, I was never going to be a professional swimmer in my own mind. Yeah. So it, it was, it was um, certainly my early years, a lot easier just to treat it as a hobby, which is a, a good way of being successful. You know, when I got into my older years, that's what I tried to, bring it back to you know remembering why remembering why i did it and when it was just when it was fun mm. mate your olympic experiences and we'll get to sydney a little bit later but with barcelona and atlanta four medals combined from both um getting gold in the 200 at atlanta talk to me about your olympic experiences and how much different or more confident sort of were you in atlanta based off your you know barcelona experience four years earlier mm. Uh, Barcelona again was a um, um, first time you do something is always really fun, isn't it? And it's the Olympics in Barcelona were amazing. Um, we stayed right on the water in big high rises overlooking the water, and it was just beautiful, really beautiful city, really European feel. Um, swimming wise, I thought I was very focused for Barcelona. I had the one event pretty much I was really focused on, the Tour de Fly, and I was with my old coach, Mr. Wakefield, still at that stage thought um I actually definitely thought I would I could win in Barcelona and once again had no pressure on me um no one was expecting me to do anything I ended up coming I ended up coming third in that race 
Um, I think I, I led for three laps. Well, I, could, I knew I led for three laps because I knew I was leading with one lap to go. Um, and probably just, I'd taken it out a bit too hard because I really tightened up with 25 to go. Yeah. Ended up getting um, bronze. But I was really excited about getting that bronze, I remember. I was really happy and um, and then just had an awesome time. I was, you know, I was still pretty young. Was I, turned, I think I turned 19 at the Games. So, um, you know, it's a fun age to be at the Olympics and finish competing. Yeah. <laughs> there was, that, that village was amazing. There was bowling, a bowling alley, a cinema, I remember um, free Mars bars and soft drink and pizzas. And uh, yeah, it was cra- It was, uh, yeah, it was good fun. I'm glad you mentioned that. I want to come back to Atlanta in a minute, but you've led me into what I was about to say next. So I might as well jump into it. The Athletes Village obviously was a different vibe, as you said as opposed to, say, Sydney, because Sydney was such a pressure cooker in terms of, of the public and everyone's watching you guys and expecting so much. But at those stages, especially at Barcelona, did you feel a bit more free and able to just enjoy yourself a little bit more and actually take advantage of the, the village life and meet people and chat and be a bit more relaxed? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, more so when the swimming was over. Um, yeah. Because we're still, you know... We were on a pretty strict re- regime with Don Talbot before the swimming had fin- been finished. But um, certainly when the swimming was over, it was a lot more relaxed. You know, you you could come and go as you please. A bit security wasn't um, a problem. I don't think phones phones weren't invented yet, were they? So you kind of just had to be, you were meant to just be back at the village at a certain time, but they were pretty easy going. We went out, you know, <laughs> to yeah. nightclub stuff and had parties and um um, w- went to watch a lot of different sports as well. Um, but yeah, it was, yeah, it was certainly, it was fun. <laughs> I've always wanted to ask guests on the show about the village life and, and the sort of behind the scenes, but I know I'm never going to get the answers I really want to hear, but I know I just, I'd love to have like a, I don't know, what would you call it? Uncensored uh, adults only version of just how fun the, the life is outside of, because obviously no one's going to, well, this is a, a family show, but you know what I'm saying. There's, there's definitely yeah, a lot yeah. of fun and partying and dance floor antics and all that sort of stuff that would go on. I reckon we I didn't see anything too crazy, to be honest, but um, Barcelona was the only village that I stayed in when I'd finished competing. So in Atlanta, I was with my husband, Cliff, then. And so I just, in the second week, I moved into his hotel. And in Sydney, I also moved out into his house. He was living in Sydney at the time. So Barcelona was um, the only time I spent in the village. But I think we were, well, I reckon, well, certainly I was still pretty innocent compared to most most people. But I've heard all the, I have heard all those stories. I haven't seen a lot of that, to be honest. But um, it's certainly a, a fun place for a teenager. You know, to do teenage you know, just stupid stuff. Yeah. What about Atlanta? Obviously, as I said, you know, four years on from Barcelona, you were more experienced by this stage. I think you were certainly starting to dominate the 200 fly by that stage as well. And you were coming into your own, um, you know, experience wise. How do you look back at that? Yeah, well, I changed coaches in 1994 and I'd moved to Scott Volkers and he'd been really successful with Sam Riley, breaststroker. And we'd kind of been pushing ourselves off each other I think in training and really excuse me doing some crazy um sets so I arrived in Atlanta I was I'd won I was oh, the fastest in the world the year before I presume but anyway I arrived as probably the favorite in the 200 meters butterfly but still didn't feel any pressure because I hadn't really done too much um and felt really really confident um thought that I to be honest I thought that I would probably win in Atlanta, it's easy to say that, I suppose, after you've done it. But uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I felt really good. It felt like everything everything went pretty well. I felt really fit, and I was doing really good times in training, and and ended up winning it, uh, winning the tournament fly there. So it was a good meet. The actual Olympics experience wasn't anywhere near as fun as Barcelona. Mm. They did really. Um, it was a really terrible Olympics. Actually, we all we just stayed in. Um, a dorm, dormitory, university dormitories, and they didn't really go to much effort. It didn't seem like to make it a really razzmatazz type Olympics, but um, the results were good, so that's the main thing. 
Hey, two years before, as you just mentioned, you, you made that decision to leave longtime coach Bernie Wakefield and train with Scott Volkers. Firstly, I just want to touch on, I love how you do call him Mr. Wakefield, because I think it's a show of respect and almost how the Americans call their coaches coach. I don't know if you watched all those American movies, it's always coach, coach. I find that super respectful. You don't see that these days. People... No, they don't even just call me my name. They call me other sorts of things behind my back. So it's not even just my name. But how difficult was that decision to, to move programs at that stage? Because it obviously had a profound you know, impact on you and your swimming career. So it must have been a big decision. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, I look back at it now more and think, oh, wow, that was a big call to do that. And that mm. must have been heartbreaking. But at the time, you know, you kind of, I was pretty cold hearted cold hearted. I, I knew that I had to, I felt like I had to do change coaches or retire. I was kind of felt like it was that stage. I don't think it was as dire as that, but in my mind, that's what I felt like. Mm. I felt like I hadn't really improved in a couple of years. I felt like the squad at Mr. Wakefield's, you know, most people had moved on. I was a lot of the times just training by myself and Mr. Wakefield was just sitting down in a chair. You know, it wasn't, he wasn't really dynamic at that stage. He was, a, he was, uh, must've been getting close to 70. Um, so I was finding find it harder and harder to go training. And then I went to, in 94, Commonwealth Games and 94 World Championships, and I wasn't really happy with my results. Looking back, they weren't that bad. But um, I think Commonwealth Games, I, I don't even know, maybe three silver and two golds. Or, and then the World Championships, I got bronze in the 100 fly and bronze in the 200 fly to two Chinese. Uh, and um, Sam Riley had had some success against the Chinese swimmers. Yeah. And many swimmers in the world who were beating the Chinese women at that stage. So I was like, oh, you know, I need, I want to go where, where Sam is so that I can beat the Chinese as well. So it was difficult, you know, our, our relationship was really fractured. Um, and then he ended up dying three weeks before the Olympics started, which I found really, um, I was probably more upset then than I was, you know, leaving when I left him, I was kind of, and then when I retired from swimming, um, it's come up a few times. Um, to be honest, it's come up a few times in like therapy situations and I didn't, you know, and I've, I've kind of regretted how I treated Mr. Wakefield and mm. how I really thanked him properly and what he did for me and that sort of thing. So he had a really big impact on my swimming career, you know, massive. Um, he laid all the groundwork and I think he had a big impact on me as a person as well. I've becoming, I spent more time with him than my own parents, as you know, is what happens when you're, you know, swimming yeah. from the age of 10. So he had a massive impact on me growing up. And then I was kind of pretty cold hearted when I left him <laughs> and kind of just blocked him off, which must have been really upsetting, I'd imagine. for him. Yeah. Is that just the swimmers thing, do you think? Because swimming can be quite all consuming and you almost have to be super selfish at times. And certainly I think that the best swimmers have to be even more so because you've got to be, you know, so diligent and getting all the right things and you've got to be comfortable with it. And it's almost like, you know, everything revolves around you and it's, you know, not in a bad way, but that's, that's what swimmers do. So then you've removed yourself. Now you're older. You can look back and go, Oh, wow. You know, maybe that was a bit too much at the time. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I didn't see it at the time, but my siblings quite often bring up my brother and sister that I was really selfish and self-centered. And I'm um, like, really? I feel like I've, out of a lot of athletes I know, I'm not really that selfish. <laughs> but um, you kind of had, well, you did, you kind of have to be, if you want to be the best in the world, you know, you've got to get enough sleep. you got to make sure everything is right. And yeah. when you're living with other people, you can be a bit intolerant of others if you feel like they're affecting, you know, how you're training and, and your success. But yeah, they hated it, it sounded like. <laughs> Growing well, up. it wasn't just you, Matt. I've talked to a few um, athletes about it and legends, and I know Libby Trickett certainly brought it up when I talked to her that, you know, life after swimming was, uh, you know, not as easy to adapt to because all of a sudden you've got to, you know, worry about your partner and your family and all these other people. And you're attending to everyone where when you're a swimmer, everyone's attending to you. It's, I've got to train today. I've got to do this. I've got to, and everyone works around that. So it's not yeah. just you, Matt. I think it's a, definitely a swimmer's thing. Well, everyone, yeah. Yeah, I found that too when I had children as well. Yeah, it is hard to think of other people. I feel like that's all I do now is think of other people. <laughs> yeah, <but> I, <laughs> it's, got, it's got all the way around. <laughs> yeah, it's a full, kind of full circle. Don't worry about that. <laughs> what about Scott Volkers, mate, and your work with him while we're on your coaches? What influence did he have on, on your career and certainly, you know, towards the end of it? Yeah, so I spent my last uh, six years with him. He was an amazing coach as well. Um, 
he was um he just had so much energy on pool deck he knew the right things to say he was really calm at big competitions which i re really really liked um you know sometimes you can see that no coaches get nervous at big competitions and i think it can rub, rub off on athletes mm. but um he was always really calm and yeah it was really clever got got a lot of took a lot of ideas of other coaches wasn't afraid to ask other coaches i think for advice mm. And yeah, I don't know. He was a, a perfect coach for me from the, for the end of my career. I had Petrea on the podcast. I'm just dropping names like it's blood. They're just dropping oh, wow. everything. But I had, had Petrea on the podcast last season. And she said, there's no doubt that having you next to her through her career, you know, domestically racing helped push her to her limits. Even, you know, you know, national championships almost become, you know, world championships with you two going head to head because that's almost what it became once you got to Com Games and things like that. And you, I mean, you guys went one, two in Atlanta, didn't you? So, you know, how much did you enjoy racing Patria through your career? Because for me, she's someone who I don't think gets enough credit sometimes for how bloody tough she was and the things that she, she achieved as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Patria's tough. Um, I hated racing Patria. <laughs> I hated racing her. Um, Cause she was always there. You know, she was very, very consistent as well. She never really had a bad swim except when her shoulders were really playing up. You know, she, was quite often out with major shoulder operations, yeah. not just the little ones, you know, where they go in and have a look. She was, you know, full reconstructions or whatever she got done. Um, yeah, we were really good for each other. We, especially on training camps and things like that and racing. But I didn't enjoy it. No, I would have preferred to have no one there, <laughs> but I wouldn't have swum as, swum as fast. But yeah, I mean, the Olympics after I, finished in Athens she went crazy didn't she didn't she win three gold medals um she yeah in Athens yeah she won the 100 fly which it's still I um when I re-watched it before her interview um I got goosebumps just because if you know her career and obviously all the you know the shoulder reconstructions and the things she went through and to still be in there fighting beat Inga de Bruin who you know she's one of the the greatest swimmers of all time herself as well um yeah, it was a big moment Oh yeah, amazing. I mean, her shoulders were crazy. I remember being at a World Cup overseas with Patria, and she did a turn at it in a. It was a fifty meters butterfly, in a short course event, and at the twenty five meters, just doing the turn dislocated her shoulder. <laughs> so, <sighs> they must have been so loose her shoulders. They just yeah. used to fall out. <laughs> oh. But yeah, so she was able to hang in there. Outside of breaking the 200 fly world record uh, and your Sydney Games experience, which we'll get into in a minute, when you look back on your Hall of Fame career in the pool, what memories and highlights sort of stand out to you? Because, you know, I can sit here and give you highlights that I loved watching, but it's not for me to say. What, like, your thoughts and your highlights will probably be very different to mine. What were some things that sort of stand out the most to you when you look back? Wow. That's a hard question. Um... The main thing is um, I feel like I never had a bad meet over, you know, two, I think it's 12 years when you go 89 to 2000 somehow, yeah. how many years it is. So I'm, I'm really proud of uh, the consistency that I had every single meet, but actually events. Um, you, know, you mentioned the world record in Atlanta and Barcelona. Um, you know, meets that really stick with me, I suppose, are the Auckland Commonwealth Games in 1990, just first Commonwealth Games. Mm. Um, World Championships in Perth in 1998. Yeah. Amazing. Um, the crowd and the atmosphere there. Commonwealth Games in KL, uh, the 200 fly there when I got my sixth gold medal. Um, and I think total of 10 gold medals at all of my Commonwealth Games. Really stands out as well. Um, even the 400 free in KL when I won the... 400 free in um so yeah it's just uh, a lot of different events it's kind of a bit of a blur but mm. um yeah i've got a lot of good memories we had a really good team spirit um always felt really like part of the team i don't know there was never i never doesn't feel like there was any clickiness or bitchiness and stuff so i don't know just i've got good memories of being in the in the swimming team I want to go back to just quickly, you know, you racing Patria and what we talked about in terms of, you know, you guys, world-class uh, world athletes, sorry, tongue-tied, um, you know, pushing each other. Do you think at times uh, Australian swimming at the moment does lack that? We definitely have world-class athletes, don't get me wrong, 
but you guys were all in the finals of the Australian Championships and it was almost like at times, I know when Libby was racing Jody Henry and Alice Mills and, you know, that was almost a, a world-class final as well. Do you think we're lacking maybe the depth at the moment? Yeah, we've got the standouts. We've got Cole, we've got um, Kate, um, you know, Bronte, with you know, Ariane. But do you think we're maybe lacking the depth in terms of having four or five people around those guys? Oh, it's really hard for me to comment because I haven't followed the times closely. I probably wouldn't be an informed comment. I do know that there seems like there's a fair bit of depth in some of the girls' events um, with Emma McKeon mm. and Bronte and Kate. Um, but I don't know my statistics very well. But I know that... Um, a lot of those events, those girls' events in the free and fly that if, and the backstroke that, you know, if you make the top two, then you, you've got a chance of winning a medal at the, at the world championship level. Um, so I suppose that's a good sign in the girls. I, I haven't looked at the boys too much. I haven't followed, I haven't followed it closely, to be honest, enough to... Uh, um. <laughs> no, you're all right, man. I'm sure there's people sitting there going, well, what's his informed opinion anyway? He's just a coach from Sydney, so it's, it's all good. <laughs> oh, you probably, follow the, you probably follow the times a bit more. You know, when you really do it, you know what's happening and yeah. yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, I know that Emma McKinn was apparently swimming really well in the lead up to what was going to be the, you know, Tokyo Olympics. Mm. I don't know. Her free was starting to go. That's all I know because I spoke to her coach once. So Hunter Free was, you know, <laughs> going to be rivaling the Campbell sisters, I think. So all I know is that was going to be a really tough event to make the top two. For oh, the- got another year to look forward to it. Mm-hmm. Hey, 2000 uh, Olympic trials, you did something that was definitely on your bucket list, which was break the 200 meter butterfly world record held by Mary T. Maher, as I said at the beginning. I think it stood for like 19 years, something mm-hmm. like that. How long had you been eyeing that record off though? Obviously it was a, a massive moment for you. Um, yeah, seriously, probably since 1998 at the Commonwealth Games when I went, went around to 206. Uh, 206.6, six, I think I went. And I've always felt like I was way too far away from it. I think I was going to 207s and stuff. But when I went to 206 and the record was 205.9, I thought, oh, wow, now I've got a bit of a chance maybe to get it. I met um, Mary T. Ma, I don't know when, but around that time, maybe just after Atlanta or around 96, 97 or 98. And she was really normal as well. She was yeah. like, and I was, cause I, in my head, I'd always built her up to be this super freak cause she broke that record so long ago, but um, she was really normal and stuff. And that, I found that really encouraging. I was like, Oh, okay. Well maybe I can do it as well if I train hard. And, and with Scott, we really, really worked on my times to try and get the world record. We had to go uh, 28 for the first lap and then 32, 32, 32. Um, approximately so we really worked on I remember the splits for that and for a while there I'd get the first three laps but it always drop off a bit in the last the last lap and I was meant to hold 24 strokes I remember when I broke the world record I'm not even sure if I held 24 strokes on that last lap but um that was what I was meant. <laughs> I've never looked, looked at it that closely but I know that we worked on it for you know specifically with the exact splits it's one thing to say I want to break the world record but you know when you start getting down to the actual splits of how are we going to how are we going to physically break this world record is around 1998. Oh, yeah, I rewatched it earlier. I'm, if I'd known you wanted just stroke uh, counts, mate, I could have counted it for you, but I rewatched it earlier. And actually um, I have some of the, you wouldn't know this cause I don't know if you're an avid listener to off the blocks, but I have commentary on that race on the opener of my podcast. Um, cause I love Ray Warren. Everything about his commentary is, is the best to me. And I don't think anybody captures the big moment quite as well as he does. And he was cheering you on the whole way. Come, come on, Susie, come on, Susie. When you touched the wall and, and you saw that you did it, what was the, the feeling, the initial, was it relief or was it excitement? Uh, it was relief. It was like, cause I knew it was probably going to be the last time I'd be able to break it. Um, this was the trials before Sydney Olympics when I broke it. And at the Olympics, it's very difficult to do good times generally because of all the external factors of pressure and living in a village and everything that goes with it. It's, a, it's kind of a lot harder event to do fast times at. Um, so I knew it was my last chance. I knew I was going to win that race. So it was, it was virtually like a, you know, like a time trial, a bit like a training time trial. So when I finally broke it, yeah, I was like, ah, oh, I'm just oh, yeah, I finally got it. <laughs> And then um, obviously did that dance, dance on the side of the pool that I'd always joked about, you know, yeah, year previously yeah. joked that I'd do this dance if I ever broke the world record. And 
And I did. Yeah, it was exciting. It was a good night. It was a fun night, actually. I'm pretty sure Tom, Alan Thompson was there um, the night that I won. We, because it was at Homebush and we just went across to the, the pub across the road. And it was just myself and um, my family and a couple of friends. And it was some coaches. I'm pretty sure like Alan Thompson and Tony Shaw. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that gang they used to hang around. And um, yeah, so it was a fun night. Yeah, he would have. I don't know if he was. Um... You know, he wasn't head coach at the time, but he was certainly, I think, team manager around those those times. He was definitely on the team as team managers, that's for sure. I remember he had such a big presence. I remember, I think it was the Sydney Olympics ticker take parade or whatever you guys did. And and the commentators didn't know. They thought he was security because he, he's just got such a big presence. I remember them announcing, oh, they've got security. And I just thought it was hilarious. Yeah, I think he made a better team manager than team coach, actually, because he was more that... Yeah, that secure, that sort of tough guy, keeping everyone in line type person. Yeah, he was, yeah. was good. You know, he uh, he works for New South Wales Rugby League. Now, I hope he doesn't mind me giving this away. But he, he did work uh, as a general manager for the Bulldogs as well, for the NRL Bulldogs. Yeah. And uh, he definitely yeah was very good at that role in keeping, obviously, they've got a head coach. But if it got through there, they, nobody sort of got through Alan Thompson, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, no, he was good. <laughs> hey, the ride from then to Sydney, what was that like? Because for an average Joe like me, um, and I know there's other people that do podcasts, but they've been to Olympics. For, you know, for me, I'm sort of given the, the perspective of the average guy sitting on the lounge with a can in his hand. I can only <laughs> imagine um, you know, the hype and, and the expectations that came with a home games. Before we get to the racing, talk to me about the lead up and, and how did you handle that? Yeah, it was pretty intense. The, the whole lead up to Sydney. We got the Olympics seven years before we actually held it. But um, yeah, that last three months after the trials, it really sort of went up a couple of notches. Uh, it was a great time in Australian sport. Like everyone was, everyone was really into the Olympics and sport. Yeah. They? It was a crazy, crazy time. Uh, I, was, I was pretty well known um, back then. So whenever I went outside people would, of my house, people would, would know who I was and kind of openly um come up to me or uh, that type of thing which is good but um yeah like I'd be in the supermarket and people would say oh I bought tickets to your gold medal race and I can't wait to see you win the gold medal and you can do it and I mean it is it was it was really good but I as it got closer I started to get a little bit nervous thinking oh god this is <laughs> you know everyone's expecting me to win here yeah um I've got to win pretty much what if I don't win and that sort of thing but it was weird. We had a team camp in Melbourne just before. It felt different to any other Olympics because it was pretty cold. Every other Olympics I'd been to, you know, it was in summer and it was over in the Northern Hemisphere. So it was a weird build-up. And I remember being in Melbourne before it. Um, that was pretty low-key and that was good. But, yeah, it was just weird. Yeah, it was a weird time. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. Well, it's definitely, it was definitely the biggest time at the you know for swimming in Australia because that was as I said where I was kind of I think I was 14 or 15 and I remember getting all the tapes because back then you had to record everything with the videotape uh, and I got I think about seven of them ready for all the finals and I was going to record all the so I was just you know and, and it wasn't just me as you know the, the stands were packed it was it yeah. was definitely hysteria in terms of I think swimming would have been one of the biggest sports in Australia around maybe AFL and um, rugby league, maybe cricket, but swimming was certainly at that stage up there, wasn't it? Oh yeah, it was on par with all those sports, as you said. It was um, yeah, rugby league, AFL, and then swimming, pretty much. Mm. Yeah, and cricket. and Kathy Freeman, a sport by herself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, like our own sport, but um, <laughs> that was pretty much it. Yeah, everyone followed it very, very closely. How much did you enjoy the relays in Sydney? I mean, we're going to get to the individual events and everyone always talks about the individual events, but I think something that gets missed sometimes is, you know, you're racing with the girls, you got two silvers, four by one, four by two. Um, and, uh, you know, how did you, you know, enjoy racing with the girls? Because I know, as you said, you're a good competitor, so you would have enjoyed being in that team environment as well. Yeah. Yeah, I love the relays. Both those relays were after all my individual events, my main individual individual events were over as well. So, which made it even more enjoyable, but, um, realize, yeah, I've always, I never got as nervous for relays, which was good. And, um, generally swam, swam quite well. Um, the lead up to the Sydney Olympics, we were really focused on the women's four by two freestyle relay. We really thought we had a chance of winning that. We had a really good team bonding sort of around that leading up to it. So, um, 
yeah, that was that was a good event. The final ended up being myself, Gian Rooney, Patria Thomas, and um, Kirsten. I always forget her maiden name. Kirsten. Um, oh God. No, I oh, no. can't help you. I know you're looking at me like help me. Out. I know Kirsten Hill now, but um, <laughs> she was only sixteen. You know, it was um. So it was a fun group of girls. What was her name? Anyway, God. Oh, okay. I'll I'll- We'll Google it later and I'll, I'll um, edit in that spot and I'll say the name. So it's all right. I'll come oh. out looking like I've got the goods. <laughs> the 200 free gold medal. What a moment for you. It was earlier in the week. I think it was on day two or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But that was your first. It was your first individual medal. It was actually about day. It was a day before the 200 fly final. So it must yeah. have been about day five or six. Yeah, I was very nervous for that race. Um, I mean, I was nervous for the whole week. I didn't really sleep very well and I was just packing it <laughs> the whole week. I like doing multiple events though because once I get to the pool and get into my routine, you know, I feel good. I'm yeah. back to what I'm used to doing. Um, but when I got back to the village, I found it really difficult at Sydney just to, to calm down. But the day, the day of the tournament free, I qualified as fast as qualifier. And at about lunchtime that day, yeah, when the finals of that night, about six o'clock, I was hysterical because I looked at the times and not, no real super fast times had been done and I was in really good form. And so I knew that I should probably win the 200 free and that made me more nervous, which is seems ridiculous. But, you know, when you go, oh, geez, I really should win this race because there's no one else in good enough form at the moment mm. to beat me. So I rang my husband, Cliff, um, I was crying and I said, oh, I don't want to go to the pool. You know, I remember I was just counting down the days to when the swimming was over, when the Sydney Olympics was on. And he said to me, it's a swimming race. Go to the pool, put your togs on and swim as fast as you can. And it was actually really good advice for me to, to remember exactly why I got into it in the first place. You know, it was, it's a swimming race. Mm. Um, and I ended up winning, winning that event. So it was weird. I mean, I never was really, I never really focused on that event the whole time of my career. I only really focused on it uh, leading into Sydney because of the the relay. And I thought we had a really good chance of winning the four by 200 freestyle relay, but to get the gold medal was a bonus. Tell you what, you didn't die wondering. You took it out. You were leading on the, on the first hundred turn. I watched, I rewatched that today as well. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure my splits of that race either. Sorry, I think you went out in 50. Oh, I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> I was oh, going to yeah. say 55. Would that be about right? I've got no idea. I don't Honestly. know. I don't want to get it wrong. You're Susie O'Neill. I don't want to get your splits the, wrong. Um, <laughs> when I've seen it again, the girl who comes second is just, she almost gets me. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's, yeah. she's definitely good. giving you a look at the end. Like, oh, how did you do that? Because that was, she, I think she thought, you know, you said you, you thought you should win. I think she thought she should win because there was a definite uh, yeah. look. I think she's a perpetual silver medalist as well. <laughs> I don't think she ever quite got to the goal, poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, your 200 fly race, let's get to it. And it's been spoken to about, uh, you know, especially um, over the last year since, you know, the, your radio show where you, you, you watched it and, you, you know, you got a bit emotional. And I know you probably don't like bringing it up again, so I apologise. But I only bring it up because I, I enjoyed it for the fact that it was raw, it was authentic. It was definitely, you know, something that... You, you weren't making up. That's just a gut feel. That's just, you know, it hits you straight away. And I think for me, certain people, there's only select few people in the world that can understand how you were feeling in that moment. Cause I spoke to Grant Hackett, another name drop, um, not long ago. And he said, you know, he made headlines and he did mention it again on my podcast that he looks at his silver medals as failures. And he actually said, you know, he gets disgusted at times when he, he looks at them and thinks about it, which I think to everyone else looking at it, it's like, come on that's just still a silver medal but to me again for him that's a raw authentic you know he can't make that up that's just how he feels do you think that's the secret to being a champion such as yourself such as grant michael phelps ian thorpe i'm assuming those sort of guys you know i'm talking to bob bowman i've spoken to michael phelps's coach and he even says he wants to um you know he if they're having a bake-off now because bob bowman said i can bake things better than you and Michael Phelps said well no I can that's a lie and then now they're having a bake-off to see who's a better baker because it's just he yeah. can't let him you know get it over him do you think that's mm-hmm. the secret sometimes to, to being the champion is that you hate losing more than you enjoy winning mm. that's interesting you say that because I've been really reflecting on um on myself re-watching my 
um, to a fly coming second a lot and wondering what, what is it? Why, what's the feeling? And I, and that's funny that I came to that. I came to that. I hate losing more than I like winning. Mm. Exactly that. I kind of wish I could have, I wish I, in my career, I could have enjoyed my winning more than I hated losing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's really weird. And I think, and that's the other thing I've come to after, um, you know, it was good to do that thing where I cried because it made me um, kind of question a lot of things in my life or how my brain works and that type of thing about around things. And um, I go, well, I hate it that I was like that and I'm that I in my swimming career, but it actually is what made me successful. The fact mm. that I was um, really hard on myself is what made me good. So I have to kind of like it. And um, that's another thing I've spent a bit of time in therapy talking about, actually, to be honest, because it doesn't really work in real life. I'm telling you, being hard on yourself as much as I was as a swimmer and taking that through to real life is not healthy. It doesn't work and it's not fun. So I've basically spent the last 20 years, or probably the last 10 years, trying to unravel and unlearn all the things that, I, that made me a really good swimmer. Mm. And um, I know that when I talk to people, they say, at what cost, at, but at what cost um, was that? And I say, but I don't care at what cost. I would yeah. still go and, I would actually still go and do it all again because that's what I really wanted to do. And I achieved everything I wanted to achieve. So I don't care what it cost me. You know, I kind of don't, which yeah. seems dumb, doesn't it? I mean, I'm, uh, I'm working on those things and I'm definitely a lot happier and, and have a different, slightly different mindset than I had when I was a swimmer. But that is what made me successful. So I accept those parts of my personality for what they are. Mate, it doesn't sound stupid at all. And I think nowhere near in terms of what you went through. But I know for myself with, with coaching, with the podcast, I mean, I'm super competitive. I'm not going to lie about this. You know, if I see another podcast is doing well, I'm thinking, well, hang on a second. What, you know, we, we should be doing better. And I start doing, you know, two episodes a week, three episodes a week. You yeah. know, I can't, it's just in me. You know, my wife has said to me many times, like, I don't want to talk about the podcast anymore. <laughs> Can yeah. we just stop talking? And it just, it's a natural thing to, to be like that. So, you know, certainly not in any um, realm of the same, what, what you went through, but the same idea. I can definitely appreciate what you're talking about. And it is, very very hard to find the balance of just switching off and appreciating the work you actually are doing yeah 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 it's funny isn't it um you reckon you're born like that or do you reckon it's your upbringing i always um i always wonder that yeah yeah it's a good question i i think i think it's a bit of both i think it's definitely like if i look back personally for myself my dad loved sports he was very competitive if you know i still remember him waking me up one morning australia played great britain in the rugby league world <laughs> cup and and you know i can't remember ricky stewart passed the ball to mal meninga anyway they scored a try and he was just it was 3 a.m and he woke me up but he was so passionate about you know being a part of the team and the win that i i think it it did sort of lead me into always if i was going to do it i wanted to try and be the best yeah yeah, it's a good mindset, isn't it? Um, I think people are a lot happier sometimes if they don't aren't like that. But, I um, think definitely <laughs> people. <laughs> I kind of wish we could be one of those people, like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm happy. You know, don't need to keep ticking things off. To um, I think we'd get bored, mate. I think we would get bored if we were like that. I think we'd start going, okay, well, what's the next mountain yeah. to climb? What's the next thing that you can? Because I, I know, um, are, are you tr still training to do like a triathlon or something like that? Um, I did nine men last year and I think that pretty much ended my triathlon career. Um, yeah. But yeah, I still, yeah, I like to keep fit and I'm in my husband's cycling group and I can't, I can barely keep up and it, yeah, it irks me. I hate being the slowest. I absolutely hate being the slowest in the group. I, I don't know if I want to put the training in though to get better up in the group. I think I've just got to find a new, I've got to find a new group where I'm one of yeah. the best. <laughs> <laughs> but if you could go back, if you could go back into the marshalling area and now, and you could speak to yourself before the 200 fly, because I know how nervous you were. You've spoken openly about, you know, the nerves behind it. And now everything we know and everything you've just spoken about in, in terms of unraveling all of that stuff over the last 10 years, what advice do you think you'd give to yourself then? Just if you could just whisper a few, you know, a sentence in your ear. Yeah. Jeez, I don't know if I'd give any different advice. I actually don't think looking back at it now and reanalyzing it, I actually don't think I swam that badly. Um, 
you know, in the tournament fly. I was only slightly off my best time. I think I'd like to go into the mushing area and whisper in Misty Hyman's ear. That's the best. But, um, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Now, I know for me, uh, and I can speak, I think, confidently for all the listeners out there, mate, that, you know, for Aussie swimming fans, you know, you're not defined by that race by any stretch of the imagination. You know, you're defined with the consistent results over many, many years, which is why for me, I think, you know, you're one of the, the goats of our sport, not just Australian, but in the world. I know, obviously, now you've had time to, to look at it and, and move on, and you've obviously got a much better, more positive outlook on it. But was there a time in your career that you did think you were sort of defined by that race, even though you'd done everything else that you'd done? Did you think, oh, I'm always going to re be remembered for that? Um, yeah, and never so much then after I released, the, after the video was released. Um, that was after it got released. That was my... Honestly, that was my biggest concern. I'm like, that is my legacy now. Mm. Why did I do that? Why? No one even remembered. I lost that. No one even remembered. <laughs> I came back and, and I just brought everyone's attention. Um, but you know what? Then, I, then I'm like, um, I spent a lot of time in therapy. Hey? <laughs> then I'm like, Does it really matter? At the end of the day, yeah. we're all going to be ashes. We're all going to be dead. I've, got, <laughs> I've, I've um, finished more than half of my life. Most probably. I'm 47 now. And I'm still, am I really worried about what people are going to think about mm. my swimming career? You know, I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm happy with what I did. I'd like to change probably half a second of my swimming career over 12 years. So I think I have to be happy with that. And cool. um, whatever happens, happens. Mate, you certainly should be. As I said, that was just my question to what your thoughts were. I know my thoughts are that you're, you know, one of the greatest swimmers of, actually, I'll tell you what my wife said to me, who are you talking to today? And I said, the queen of Australian swimming. So that's, that's my opinion. So, <laughs> you know, what you, how you feel is your, is your own feelings, but I'm glad, you know, you're sort of, um, you know, looking more positively at it. Um, before we get to, you know, post swimming for all the younger listeners out there, um, you know, who, who, you know, are looking at doing butterfly and their coaches are saying to them, oh, you've got potential to be a really good 200 flyer, <laughs> which is almost the same conversation as I think you could be a great open water swimmer at the moment. Yeah. Cause they, this, I get the same reaction. The kids just go, oh, I don't want to do that. What advice would you give to them about, you know, trying to, to get involved in it? And what was your race plan by the way, for a good 200 flyer for anyone that's listening? Okay. Um, yeah, I remember having that exact conversation with my coach when I was about 18. I, was, I, I, I stayed away from that event, the Turn of Fly, for a lot of years. <laughs> but at 18, he said to me, you know, you've got a good chance of doing well in this event. And I remember I was like, oh, I don't want to. But then I'm like, you know, do I want to win? Do I want to be successful? Then I've got no choice. And it's not, I reckon open water's heaps worse than Turn of Fly. I reckon. Um, well, I do too, but I'm just saying the, the, kids, the kids, the I get the same reaction these days. Yeah. 200 fly in a race to me is no different from 200 free. Um, but the training is, the training is, oh, the training's only slightly worse. I wouldn't say it's hideously worse than 200 free. But anyway, um, I'd say just do it. Just do whatever event you're good at. You know, you don't really have a choice. Your body sort of, your body and muscles, um, your genetic makeup, I think kind of, um, dictate for that dictate that for you anyway um but race plan was um break it down to 450s and especially in the race because i was so nervous the first 50 i had to feel like i wasn't even trying um you know because your adrenaline makes you go a lot faster than your actually your perceived effort i felt like i was going easy but i'd quite often be going really fast so yeah. the first 50 i had to just go really slow and then the next 350s had to ha had to be three even split 50s um building each one we always worked on building each each 50 yeah. and then turning building and then turning building and just trying to get those 350s as even as possible and that don't it it felt very easy um in a race definitely the first three laps i felt like i hadn't even got a you know was puffed and how you swear how i swam those first three 50s determined on how that last 50 was gonna feel, gonna feel yeah yeah and generally the last 25 is when you 
was when I really felt the pain. So if you look at the turn of fly, but in my head, I'm thinking, well, it's only really 25 meters of pain mm. because you know, the first three and a half laps, you just, um, just going through the motion. Was that all the questions? There was one more question in that, wasn't there? No, no, that's all right. No, no, that's good. You've just made me think of another one because I want to go back to that world record because I've spoken to Eamon Sullivan and Jody Henry when they broke world records and they mentioned that when they broke the world record, it didn't actually feel like they broke. It just felt the easiest swim they'd ever done. Is that the way you felt when you, when you broke that world record in the 200? Definitely, but definitely, definitely when I broke the world record, it felt easy. But don't you think that's just because you've broken the world record and you... Well, I'm not, I, mate, I am not a world record holder in anything, so I would not know. <laughs> I, reckon that it, if I, I reckon if I had just missed the world record and touched the wall and looked up and saw I just missed it, I would have said, oh, that last 25 killed. <laughs> I reckon. <laughs> I don't know what actually, you know, what's real and what's perceived. Well, moment. it also could have been because they break the world record in the 100 freestyle and you did the 200 fly. So maybe the pain at the end might have just been a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But I'm um, certainly when when I broke it, I'd done my best splits, you know, I'd split it the the best that I could and and the right stroke rate at the beginning. Um, that first 50 looked really effortless. Like yeah. it as you said, it didn't look like, you know, you were you weren't ripping in a tear and that's for sure. It looked comfortable. Yeah, and you know that from swimmers. Hey, like I suppose Kate Campbell's probably the best example of mm. 100 free in, in Rio, wasn't it? When she obviously, her stroke rate was slightly too high the first 25. Yeah. And she didn't look bad, but the last 25, it sort of comes back to, to haunt you. So, it, yeah, it's really important to get that for the first half of your race, do it properly, and then your second half will be a lot more enjoyable. It is a fine line. So we, yeah, we talk about these days about easy speed. I don't know if that's the term you guys used to use, but um, it certainly can confuse people at times because you say it's easy speed and they go out too slow and you say, but you said easy. So no, it's still going to be fast, yeah. but it's got to be at, you know, and it's got to be soft hands and all that sort of stuff. So it doesn't certainly just doesn't uh, happen at the click of a fingers, as you mentioned, you know, how many years were you toiling away at doing those four fifties and you yeah. practiced it for so long? Yeah, a couple of years, wasn't it, for, for the actual record splits. And then when I did it, when I started really concentrating on my turn at free, I started really using the same mindset that I had yeah. for turn at high and I hadn't really done that so much. And for me as well, um, I used to always have a couple of things I said over and over in my head um, to stop that, um, that chatter, you know, that you get sometimes in, in races. So for me, it was always, I just thought long and strong, long and strong. Because we we practice the the stroke rate and the times and stuff, so there's nothing worse than you start when you start talking to yourself in a race. <laughs> well, it could very, be worse. It could be oh shit. Uh oh. No, I knew this would happen. So at least long and strong is much more positive. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah. If I didn't if I didn't do that, that's what I would have been saying. <laughs> Mate, how'd you handle life in retirement from swimming? Because you know, there's a lot of things, um, you know, they get talked about in terms of, I know a lot happens in rugby league, you know, players when they leave, all of a sudden they lose their identity. You know, they used to be a superstar and now all of a sudden they've got to, you know, go work and building a house or something like that. And they, they, they struggle to, to sort yeah. of find their feet. How, how did you go when you stopped competing? Um, I went a lot. It was a lot harder than I expected. I must admit, I thought, um, I thought because I had achieved all my goals, um, I was, I wanted to retire when I retired and I had a good relationship and didn't have any money worries as such that I thought I would be fine to be perfectly honest. But, um, I didn't count on sort of the emotional feelings, the, the withdrawal symptoms that I had from the high, probably from the highs, the real highs that I got from swimming. So it took a little while to adjust. That's for sure. The best thing I did was start doing regular exercise again, which took me a long time to get into that. But I think um, as ex-athletes, it's just important that we just keep moving. I think we're used to, well, I was certainly used to endorphins from exercise. So I try to exercise in at least an hour a day now. And I know if I haven't for a couple of days, I start to feel a bit funny. So, um, yeah, it's, be, it's been 20 years now. So <laughs> it was a little bit of a roller coaster, I suppose, for a while. For me now, I'm doing something that I love and it is kind of similar to... Um, competing at an elite level. I work on radio, um, live radio on a breakfast show. And so it gives me a lot of those buzzes, buzz, you know, that I'm, I enjoyed from my swimming career. You know, the fact that it's live and if you make a mistake, it's a, um, 
it's not a big deal, but you know, you're not meant to make mistakes and things. You can't just rehearse. Not like a podcast where I can edit it out and fix it yeah, all yeah. up. And make it, yeah. yeah. So it's like that sort of stuff. So, and it's something that energizes me. It's something that I feel like I can keep getting better and aim towards and set goals and that type of thing. So I'm in, um, yeah, I'm really, really enjoying life at the moment because I've, I feel like I've got other things, you know, on my, I'm not just the next swimmer, if you know what I mean, for me, yeah. I've got other things I'm aiming towards. I'm glad you brought us to that because that was going to be my next question. This is how just talented you are at uh, all this sort of stuff. Now you led me to the next question without even knowing it. How did a self-proclaimed shy person by nature end up on breakfast radio in Brisbane and not just any breakfast radio show. Cause I lived in Brisbane. So I know it's pretty much the number one FM radio show in Brisbane. And how much do the boys help you in sort of feeling more comfortable and coming out of your shell? Because I know they're hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I got it um, through the boys. I got the job. So it's been, it's been about seven years now since I've been on the show in any capacity. So two of the guys on the show, Ash and Lutzi, I knew when I was swimming because they were sports reporters for 4BC and um, a couple of other stations. You know, they were sort of around and they're similar age to me. So they were looking for a girl and they got me to come in and fill in for um, Mitch Lewis, who's our sports reader, who's actually Wally Lewis's son, <laughs> but um, he'd gone away on his honeymoon. And so they got me to come in and fill in for a week. And then they're like, Oh, why don't you just hang around, um, you know, for one session, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I've been there ever since pretty much. I haven't really left, but yeah, they've been so helpful. Um, they've really, really, um yeah i wouldn't have been able to do it without them at all actually so i'm really grateful to them we're really good friends off the show so that really helps we have a good time um i've learned so much and they've just been really really good um colleagues i don't know really good teachers um yeah. really accepting um yeah so to, yeah to come in and a uh, number one <laughs> you know my first radio show is, is their number one ranking right breakfast show not many people get such a um what's the word gifted start in radio. Yeah. So I'm very appreciative of them and um, it's been going well. So what's your favorite songs at the moment? Like you, you were on radio this, this morning, you would have heard songs. What's your favorite song? What do you bop around to when it comes on? Oh, geez. Thankfully Nova's going back to a bit more eighties and throwback songs. So uh, yeah, which is good. Cause I don't, I don't really follow music to be honest, but we played to Tina Turner, a Carly make of Tina Turner. Um, yeah, yeah. The, What's love got to do with it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cargo. Yeah, yeah. Cargo. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was pretty good. But I don't, I don't really follow music. We quite often talk during the music. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thankfully, yeah, they're going back to 80s, 80s hits. Like I know tomorrow we're playing Funky Town um, and another song. So... Yeah, I'm pretty easy. And how involved in all of that stuff are you now? Because obviously, as you said, at first you were kind of not tagging along, but the boys would say, all right, you basically, I'm sure they would have sort of led you through it all. But now, you know, you've been in there for a while, you're getting your confidence. How involved are you? And do you sort of pitch your own ideas? Have you got your own segments? Mm. Uh, pretty much, yeah, I'm full time now. So there's four of us on the show and we, um, yeah, we all take turns at, um, telling different stories. It's a pretty loose show. The, it's pretty loose. The boys, it's not super structured type thing. But um, yeah, I think we bounce off each other really well. Sometimes I lead stories. Sometimes, you know, other people lead, but include me in stories and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, I like to feel, I, I like that feeling like I'm tagging along, that I can, they don't put any pressure on me, you know? And yeah. so, um, yeah, it's a, I think we all know our roles and we've all got different, really different personalities. And we're not all trying to um, fight for the microphone, you know. If there's four of us, you kind of really can't all be talking at the same time. So it, it, um, it, I think it just seems to work at the moment. Well, you guys were definitely my favourite radio show when I lived up there. Um, there. There wasn't, to be fair, and I don't want to be mean to the others, but there wasn't an awful lot going on up there. You guys were head and shoulders for me above everyone else. Um, I'm currently on a quest, Susie, and it's a quest for the elusive life balance. Um, and I do ask a lot of people when they come on to help me out because I've got a, a two-year-old daughter, I've got a wife, I've got a full-time job, I've got the podcast, which, as I said to you, how competitive I am is slowly becoming very much full-time in itself. Um, but it's hard to find that, you know, that balance. What about for yourself? How, how have you gone 
looking for the balance. I'm assuming you would have done a lot of sort of self, you know, searching and then looking at your own life. Have you found it? Are you still looking for it? Does anyone ever find the balance? I wonder, that's why I keep asking. I really want someone to say yes. I reckon you're either too busy or you're too quiet. Like I've, lately I felt like I've been on a hamster wheel yeah. probably for the last year. I reckon I felt like I've been on a hamster wheel. Um, and I go, oh, I just, I want to be heaps quieter. Actually, you know what? I was, felt like I had the perfect life balance during Corona lockdown. <laughs> I had lockdown when you didn't have to go anywhere or take anyone any. Were you doing work from home? Did they set you up at home or were you able to still go uh, in? We still went into the studio, which was good. But you know how everyone was home from school. There was no yeah. school support and there's no functions or appearances or that sort of thing. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm someone who think, like you said, I think I have to be kind of busy. I don't know if I could ever not have things going on because I don't know, I'm just that type of person. But yeah, I'd like to be a bit quieter than I am currently at the moment. I've got a few things going on that are a little bit um, busy, but hopefully in the next two months or so, it'll quieten down a bit. So I can't help you too much. Sorry. Especially yeah, thank if you, you. Especially if you've got um, little kids. Because one thing for us is um, in three years' time, all our kids have finished school. Yeah. I figure life will get a lot quieter after that. But a two-year-old, wow, you're like constantly, you're constantly doing stuff. Yeah. And she just says dada a lot. So it makes me feel guilty if I'm, you know, doing this and I can hear her at the door of the garage going, dada, dada. And you're like, oh, should uh -huh. I be in here doing these things? Like you sort of question you know yeah. what what's you know where where should you be but um, yeah. i definitely don't enjoy this don't get me wrong but I certainly it does break your heart when you hear a calling for you that's for sure yeah it's a hard one i don't know can't answer you can't help you your kids getting older now <clears throat> pardon me um is that going to be both a, uh, an exciting and a sad time for you do you think um, sad that yeah. they're leaving the nest in a certain way but also exciting that you're probably gonna you know yeah. the you know, the load's going to be a little bit less. Yeah, it's a hard one. Hey, you I mean, they're pretty, they're pretty self-sufficient um, now themselves. They're 14 and 16. Um, yeah, it's going to be weird. Um, I would be, I always think of that. It's going to be weird when they leave home, but kids yeah. stay at home now until they're about 30, don't they? I don't imagine. <laughs> I tried not to, but I, I, I know some of my mates definitely do. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it's a really weird time. Time just flies, doesn't it? You know, I've really started to notice that how quickly time goes and trying to enjoy it as much as as much as we can but um yeah we're really proud of how they're turning out they're um great kids they're you know they're sporty and they're into their school work and um they've got some good friends so yeah we're happy with how they're going Mate, with the 20-year anniversary coming up of sydney you, have you got them and pinned them on the on the lounge to watch some of the races or yeah no, they're pretty funny they, their favorite <laughs> saying is the Oh yeah, we get it, Mum. We used to be. <laughs> we, get it. we get it. So, uh, yeah, they're pretty funny. They keep me. They certainly keep me grounded. I was going to say that's certainly a way to keep you grounded. You've gone from an interview with me, who's called you the Queen of Australian Swimming, and Madam But, and just built you up, and then you know you'll turn off to that to hear. Yeah, we get it, Mum. You're a big deal. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you get this question a lot, but do, do you have any advice to all the young swimmers out there who listen to the podcast in terms of chasing their goals sort of in the way you did in your career and how you went about it? Um, yeah, just I'd just probably say anything is possible. You know, early on in my career, you know, when, when I dreamt I might be, a, you know, might win a gold medal or would like to win a gold medal, I thought, oh, people like me don't win gold medals. You know, you've got to be you know, extraordinary to win gold medals. And then I realized that they're just normal people. So I suppose I would say to kids, don't, you know, don't discount what you can achieve because, um, you know, if you really put your mind to it and, and work hard, then you, you never know what's possible. Um, and I was really big on um, not missing any laps and not missing any training sessions. And I think eventually consistency adds up, you know. But um, you've got to really love doing it. As you know, for swimming, you've got to, um, you know, you've got to be passionate about it and want to put the effort into it. It's a difficult sport. Um, my kids, my kids detest it. They can't understand why anyone would want to do it. They are really shocked. They go, what did you really like? Did you really like going to swimming training, mum? Because we hate it. So, but I think if you love it, you know, you love any, any swimmers know the feeling, don't they? Yeah. So if you love it and um, then just really believe in yourself and train as hard as you can and be consistent in each session and see what happens.
Love that thing about not missing any laps. What's the saying? If you cut corners, you end up going around in circles. So Pretty much. it's definitely, um, definitely a good one. Finally, Susie, mate, I want to talk to you about your legacy in terms of our great sport. And this is always a hard one for, for people. I, I don't think I've had anybody um, who I've asked this to, Eamon, um, Jody, um, Grant, they all sort of took a pause because, <laughs> you know, it's something that probably doesn't come natural to boast about yourself or to, to talk about it. But what do you want your legacy to be in, in our sport? You know, how do you hope you're remembered? If I say, you know, as my daughter gets older, I said, well, mate, I'm going to watch Susie O'Neill. How would you like to be remembered as an athlete? Um, I think as someone who always gave 100%, always, you know, never was soft, um, always gave everything in every race she did. And I'd like to be remembered as a good sport, actually, as someone who was um, a good sport. And... You know, I was a really good competitor, but um, I felt like I could still be friends with my people I was racing against. So, um, yeah, I felt like I could keep, I could compartmentalise uh, my sport as, you know, as a competition in a pool. So I'd like to be remembered like that, someone who gave 100% but left it in the pool at the end of the day. Absolutely, mate. Well, I think that's a perfect chance to, to wrap it up, mate. I want to thank you for coming on the show. I know you're busy. Um, you worked this morning, went for a swim. So I really appreciate you coming on for a chat. It's been my honor and my privilege to, to go through your remarkable career. Um, you're a champion in and out of the pool. One of the most inspirational athletes uh, ever in our sport, in, in my opinion. And I want to thank you, you know, for your unbelievable contribution. To, to our sport one of the toughest most determined and gifted I, I think yeah you've got to have you know um a big heart and work hard but if you're not gifted as well it certainly can only take <laughs> you so far so i think one of the most gifted athletes uh, we've ever had it's been my pleasure to have you on off the block swimming podcast thank you very much <laughs> today's episode of off the block swimming podcast is proudly brought to you by arena australia and arena ends it Today's episode of Off The Block Swimming Podcast is proudly brought to you by Pro Swim Workouts.